So friends, as we gather today, uh, we continue with a story in Mark chapter 1. As if you've been following the services online, you will know that we be dealing with Mark chapter 1 uh, lately. And I just want to recap a bit for you uh, before I share with you uh, what is the theme for today. Because, <clears throat> because next Sunday is Transfiguration Sunday, which means then we ca I can't finish Mark chapter 1. I'm going to have to jump to Transfiguration. So let me recap a bit what Mark chapter 1 was all about. If you remember and you've been following us online, you know that Mark chapter 1, firstly, we started with John preparing the way for Jesus. So John was preparing the way for Jesus, preaching forgiveness, baptism, and repentance. Then straight after that, and then we know that there was a baptism of Jesus that took place. And him, when he was tested, because the Bible says straight after baptism, the Spirit took him to the wilderness. And then the third thing that took place in uh, Mark chapter 1 is that whilst Jesus then on his way back, and then he, John was imprisoned. So Jesus had to start preaching the good news himself. As you know, John said, the one is coming. So Jesus started doing that. And then the fourth thing that happened here was when Jesus was calling his disciples. So he gathered his men together as he was going to start his work. And then last week, if you remember, it was him healing the man with impure spirit and demon possessed. And then today, we find Jesus continuing with the healing ministry. Because today he's healing Simon, Simon's mother-in-law, and not only her, but the many that were brought to him. Not only that, then he went on to preach the good news. So that's why we're here today, listening or watching Jesus healing Simon's mother-in-law and healing the many that were brought to him, and him spreading the good news. So if we were going to continue with Mark chapter 1, next week he was going to be the healing of the man with leprosy. But as I've said, we're going to jump that one next week and go straight to transfiguration. So then, what is it then that we can learn from this story? As we find then Jesus continuing with his earthly ministry, and part of that ministry was healing, but not only healing, but also spreading the good news. Hence, my theme for today is Jesus the healer and preacher. Because today we see Jesus being the healer, but not only the healer. Because most of us, we focus on the healings, but we forget at the later stage. He says to his disciples, let's leave these people. Let's go and spread the good news throughout Galilee. So today I want to portray to you the Jesus who is the healer and also the Jesus who is the preacher. What is it then that we can learn from this Jesus who is the healer and the preacher at the same time. Let me then suggest, friends, few things that we can learn from this story. The first thing that we learn from this story is Jesus visiting the sick. And friends, that's a very critical ministry. So what Jesus then teaches us here is that part of our calling as God's people is to take care of the sick. We find Jesus visiting the sick. Listen to this, Mark 1, verse 30 to 31. Simon's mother-in-law, so now they've left the synagogue, right? So Jesus and his disciples were at the synagogue, and they've left the synagogue. On their way, then the Bible said, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. I know the last part for feminist theology is not the right part. As my wife alluded this week and say, why did they wait for her to be healed before she could save them? Why couldn't they save themselves? But we are not here for that. We are not here for feminist theology today. We are here for healing. Yes, if I was here for that, I will elaborate more on that. But Jesus then, the Bible says, and I want you to note this, friends. They told him about her. There's no way in the Bible where it says, then he was invited to go and see her. And I want you to note that, that our Lord Jesus Christ, when there is need for help, he does not wait for an invitation to heal us. The moment Jesus heard that Simon's mother-in-law was sick, what did he do? He went and visited her. And friends, remember this. What's more important, you know what I like is when Luke elaborates on this. Luke says, not only did Jesus heal her, but Jesus rebuked the sickness. Jesus rebuked the fever when he got there. So what did Jesus do upon visiting her? He held her hand and she was healed. Luke in chapter 4 goes further because Luke and Mark speak about this healing. Luke in chapter 4, verse 38 to 39 goes further to say, not only did he heal her, but Jesus rebuked 
the sickness in her life. So friends, we need to know this. We've got power from Jesus. Because remember, I spoke about Jesus who heals with authority not so long ago. So Jesus has given us that authority as those who believe to rebuke sickness. You see what we do as believers when the sickness, we complain about it. We complain about how the government is not doing enough. How the government is doing ABC. And I want to encourage you to do this. We are faced with COVID-19 now. We are faced with a sickness that we don't know when it will ever end. But we are told here, one of our mission as believers, when we pray, is to rebuke sickness. And Jesus will answer for us. So Jesus goes there without invitation. <clears throat> and secondly, friends, the Bible says they just came from the synagogue. Many scholars argue that the reason they were at the synagogue it is because it was Sabbath day. So therefore, on Sabbath day for Jewish people, they are not meant to be working. So when Jesus heals us, when we are in need of help from God, what does God do? He breaks the rules to come close to us. Oh, by the way, I'm not Jesus. I'm not going to break the rules to see you when you are sick with COVID. <laughs> but that's what Jesus does. I mean, the teachers of the law, the Bible doesn't say it, but I can tell you the teachers of the law were not happy with what he did because on Sabbath day, he was not supposed to do that. He's not supposed to be working. But when Jesus heard one of his people that they were sick, what did he do? He did not care about the rules. Why? Because he was doing the right thing. When you're doing the right thing, sometimes, friends, we need not to care about the rules as long as we don't break the rules. Jesus was not breaking the rules because he knew that someone was in need. So him, instead of saying, this is what the law says, he says, grace and mercy says, I must go and heal that person. Sometimes the grace of God is above the law. And that's the truth we need to stand for. So he went and healed on a Sabbath day, even though... According to the Jewish law, it was not the right thing to do. Why? Friends, this story demonstrates how much Jesus loves us. This story demonstrates how much God loves his people. This story demonstrates how much God cares for us. This story demonstrates how much God can do for us and what God is willing to do for each and every one of us. So never doubt the presence of God in your life. Never doubt the power of God in your life. Never doubt what is God is willing to do for you in your life. Because here Jesus demonstrates that people come first and the law comes last. Because he visited the sick and he touched them and he rebuked the sickness on a Sabbath day. And that's what Jesus came to do. He fulfilled his ministry and mission. That's the first thing, Jesus visiting the sick. The second thing, we learn from this story. Jesus does not turn away people who are in need. Now, imagine this in this chapter one, what has ha had happened in the life of Jesus. Just imagine this. Jesus spent 40 years, sorry, 40 days in the wilderness, straight after his baptism, right? So you can imagine being in the wilderness, fasting, not eating, and then coming back. Straight after coming back, what did he do? He did not wait. He went to call the disciples. Straight after that, what did he do? He went to the synagogue, healed the man with the impure spirit and demons. And then now, he went to preach at the synagogue and left the synagogue to heal Simon's mother-in-law. Straight after that, the Bible says in Mark chapter 1, verse 32 to 34, that evening after sunset, I'm sure that by then they'd finished eating lunch. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove away out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. So this man did not get rest. This man must have been tired. But, but yet, in spite of it all, in spite of him being tired, in spite of him not resting, what did Jesus do? When people brought their sick ones, because they said everyone was at the door, people were gathered at the door, and they wanted healing, Jesus did not turn them away. Imagine that. If you were to come to me on a Monday, I will tell you it's my day off. Come see me tomorrow. I guess because I'm not Jesus. 
But what we learn from Jesus is that he makes time for people. What we learn from Jesus is that he cares so much that he goes and, and, and do whatever he needs to be done. Why? Because that was his mission. His mission was to save, heal, and preach the good news. Jesus knew the agency of his mission. He knew that he's got only 30 years left to do everything. He knew that. So he did not have enough time. There was no time for him. No, sometimes I wish we would be like Jesus. We know when we're going to die. But unfortunately, God did not give us that opportunity. But because Jesus knew all these things, he knew that there was no time to waste, there was no time to wait, but the time to continue and heal God's people. Remember his mission, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, when he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has appointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives, to help men recover their sight, and to free the oppressed. So Jesus knew why he was here. His mission was to proclaim the good news. His mission was to set the captives free. That is why he could not wait. That is why, even though he had done all this work, when people were at the door, what did he do? He healed them. Remember what he says in Luke chapter 20, verse 28. He says, the Son of Man did not come to be saved, but the Son of Man came to save and to give his life for his people. And sometimes how I wish, as those who are called by God, as ministers, as preachers, as pastors, as leaders of the church, how I wish sometimes we can understand this, that we are not here to be saved, but to serve God's people. You know, sometimes when I visit churches, I struggle. Because the first thing, when they see you come in with a dog collar, what do they do? They will put you in front. You know, one of the things I love about being here at BMC is the fact that I can sit anywhere I want. But let me tell you, if I were to go to other Methodist churches, not all of them, even when they see you sitting at the back, someone will come and say, no, no, your place is up there. And I always think, you know what? Actually, my place is at the back because I'm called to serve and not to be saved. I remember the young people, you know, I love young people, so we had this um, as a youth synod not the main synod or general synod. So there's a youth synod in the Methodist church before the main synod where we discuss young people's issues. <laughs> and one of the resolutions there, which I didn't know when I come from, came from seminary, that was the case. It was my first year out of seminary. One of the resolutions there was, we should stop, uh, I'm not going to name the circuit, circuit so-and-so, we believe that we should stop this thing of serving the ministers and giving them the better food before everyone else eats. <laughs> I thought to myself, that's a crazy thing to, to, to say at a synod. But then I realized that the young people were saying, we are all equal. I'm sure TK, even in your synod, you once said that. Young people were saying, Look, listen here, we are all equal here. Stop this nonsense of having better food for the ministers in a different room. And then we, not so-called ministers, we just eat whatever is being served to us. And when I got there, I realized why they were saying that. Because the way the table was prepared in the room for ministers, wow. It was nice to be a minister that day. <laughs> but but we, you won't believe we spent over 30 minutes arguing about this. And I thought to myself, seriously? <laughs> Are we going to spend 30 minutes arguing who should eat what, where, who's better than the other? Instead of reminding each other that we are all equal and we are all God's people. And that's what Jesus always reminds his people. And remember when the angel came to Jesus' mom and dad, what the angel said. He said, Mary will bear a son. You shall call him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sin. So that's what Jesus was doing there that day. That's why he did not turn away God's people. Friends, let me remind you this. Jesus will never turn you away when you are in need. What you need to do is go in front of his throne of grace and lay it all on the cross. Just lay it all there. Lay it all on Jesus. Don't think you're burdening God when you're praying. Don't think God gets tired of you, no. That's what God wants. He wants you to do that continuously. Thirdly, 
apart from him visiting the sick, apart from him not turning away God's people. We learn here that Jesus lived and led a prayerful life. Jesus lived and led a prayerful life. So, so now he came out of the synagogue with all what I've told you. He came out of the synagogue. He went and healed Simon's, uh, mother, Simon Peter's mother-in-law. He went and healed many who were sick. And then straight after that, listen to what Jesus says. <coughs> Sorry, what he does in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. It says, very early in the morning. So he did all he had to do, went to sleep, I guess, and then very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. He did everything during the day. Early in the morning, he did not wake anyone. The Bible says he got up very early in the morning. It was dark. He left the place. He went to pray. Why? Because he lived and led a prayerful life. Let me then suggest some of the reason Jesus did all these things. Because it is not the first time in the Bible where we find Jesus leaving people and going away to pray. Because I don't want to keep you, I'm just going to give you six reasons why Jesus sometimes chose to be in a solitary place. Whenever Jesus won, whenever he had to prepare for a major task, that's what happened. The first example we see, because remember, the major task for Jesus was his ministry. So before his ministry, what happened? He went to the wilderness for 40 days. Let me tell you. If Jesus did not want to go to the wilderness, even though the Spirit led him there, he would not go. He had that power. But because Jesus knew the importance of solitude, and, and sometimes that's what we miss as God's people, the importance of solitude. Friends, it is very important at God's people to create space and time to be alone. Space and time to pray. Space and time to be away from the noise. Space and time to be still and know who God is. Space and time to be in the presence of God without anyone. And that's what Jesus did here. Because he knew there was a task ahead. He knew. You know, one of the things I've practiced over in ministry is that every time I'm changed to a different church, <coughs> excuse me, because in the Methodist church, whether you like it or not, you will be changed. You may love people, people may love you, but there will, time, there will come a time where you need to go. But whenever I go to a new church, I always say to the stewards of the church that I'm at, I said, I'll work until the first week of December. Then I'll go and be alone with God because I know by the 16th of December, I need to be at a new church. And I realize that if I don't do that for myself, by the time I get to a new church, I come with a bargain from this other church. And then the next thing, the first time you see me, you see this sour minister who doesn't even smile. You have no clue how much he's caring. And I'm taking all of that on you, and you, have, you didn't do anything to me, and you don't even know me. But I've learned over the years, if you don't create time for yourself, that's what happens in ministry. And I want to tell you, that's why sometimes you will find a grumpy new minister. It is because he or she is carrying a bargain from the other church. And all he or she needs are people and leaders around him or her to say, you know what, take time. We'll give you a week, come back after a week. Deal with yourself. So Jesus knew the only way he can do his ministry is if he deals with himself before going to the next task. Because remember, the next task was healing a man with leprosy. So he knew that I needed space and time without disciples, without people, and just be on my own. And then after that time, he can continue to do his work. And this does not only happen in ministry, friends. I can, I'm sure all of us, we can agree here in our jobs that we do, in our daily jobs, in our daily callings. We sometimes take leave. Why? Because you need to be on your own. Before you murder someone at your workplace, <laughs> You need to go away. So let me advise you, even Jesus knew before murdering someone at work, he needs to go away. And maybe when you come back, you love them. So friends, remember that. You need solitude when you're about to do a major task. Secondly, Jesus needed solitude to recharge after a hard work. That's what he needed to do. Remember what he would do. He would sit 
send his disciples to go and do the work, and then we'll be remain behind praying. When they came back, I think it's Luke or Mark, yeah, Mark chapter 6, when they come back, he advises them to also leave the people that they've gathered for him. So he will be left behind, let the disciples do the preaching, the disciples will evangelize, bring people to Jesus, what would Jesus say? And then he says to the disciples, separate from the people. Because he knew that each and every person needs to recharge. Friends, we need time to recharge. If Jesus would take time to recharge, who are we not to take time to recharge? Burnout is not a nice thing. Because when you are burnt out, everyone else, everyone around you is an enemy. And you're ending up hating more people than doing good at what you do. We might be all good at what we do, but let me tell you, we need time to recharge so that we may not hate people. I know in South Africa, social media, they've got this new thing now, thinking, thinking teachers are the blessed in this world <laughs> because you guys got an opportunity of long holidays. But I always say to them, that was a good thing because they've got lives as well. And I do believe, even when you're on holiday, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm the only one, even when you're on holiday, you still worry about your work. You still plan to do things. Sometimes people forget that. I try my level best not to think about church when I'm away. But there's always that thing on the back of my mind. But in spite of that, you need that time not to see the people that you work with. That reason why Jesus would go into solitude sometimes is to work through his grief. Friends, even Jesus took time when he was grieving. Remember after he had Matthew 14, after he heard about John being beheaded, he took time to go and grieve. Friends, it is important that when you lose a person you love, when you lose a member of your family, be your sister, your brother, your, your spouse, your dog, your cat, your pet, you need time to grieve. Because those people, those pets, they've been with you for the rest of your life, or most of your life. So when you lose something special, you need to just take time off and just allow yourself to grieve, allow yourself to cry, allow yourself to fill the head. Then you can go back to normal. The fourth reason Jesus would go to solitude, it's when he was about to make an important decision. Do you remember in Luke chapter 6, before he... When, when he called his disciples and then before making them apostles, you remember what he did? The whole night, the Bible says in Luke chapter 6, he spent the whole night praying before going to his disciples and saying, guys, now let's do this. So friends, when you're about to make important decisions, you need to take time away from everything and away from everyone. In time of distress, Jesus went away by himself. Remember before his crucifixion, Mount Olives? He left his disciples, they were sleeping. Went away, started praying. In time of distress, you need to seek God. In time of distress, you need to be in a quiet place with God. Sometimes in time of distress, you don't need people's advice and telling you what to do and not to do. You need to consult God and ask him to show you the way forward. And lastly, Jesus would simply go away just to focus on prayer. Many times in the Bible, Luke chapter 5 is a good example. Jesus will go away just to pray. Not for anything specific, just to pray. Sometimes you need that to, that to go away just to pray. There are no problems in your life. You're not facing any difficulties. There are no achievements in your life. Because we don't need to be prompted by pain and joy to pray. We need to lead and live a prayerful life, which means sometimes you just go to pray. When people ask you, why do you need time and space? You just say, I just want to pray. Why are you praying? For no reason. To communicate with God. You don't need a reason to pray. You don't need a reason to be with God. So friends, let us, let us make it fashionable, the fact that we can go away and just pray without any need. I'm sure God wants that from us sometimes. That when we kneel, we, not, we don't have anything to ask. We just say, God, speak to me. I'm your servant. Lastly, friends, before I keep you here too long, 
the last thing that we learn from this story, which is the fourth thing, is that the good news are meant for everyone. I know sometimes we struggle to understand this concept as Christians because we all, I think the Jews are the same. Uh, they think their religion is just for them or their Jesus who's coming is just for them. As Christians, we are the same, thinking Jesus is only for us. Listen to what Jesus says when this verse closes, 38 to 39. So he went to pray, came back. He says, oh, no, no, they went and say, everyone is looking for you. And then Jesus says to them, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. So Jesus did not just stay in one place. And I think that's why the Methodist Church has got what they do to ministers. Where you go to one place and then you move. You go to one place and then you move. There are times, let me tell you, for family reasons, every minister would love to be in one place. But there are times when you are stationed at a place, you feel, you know what, God, I've done my best, I've done all that I can give to this community. I won't name the name, but I remember as a youth pastor, there was a minister I worked with, he's close to his retirement now. I, was, I just served with him one year in that church. In the March leaders meeting, as we are going to go to the quarterly meeting in April, he said to the leaders, my time is up with you. They said, but you've just been here for 11 years. He said to them, I've done everything. I've given everything. And I've got nothing to give anymore. And then he said to them, it's not that I don't love you. They started suggesting, you know what? You can take some time off, can give you a month off. He said, no, I think my gifts are needed somewhere else. And I respect that man, that man and I still respect him up to today for that. Because it got to a point where he felt as a man of God who's called to minister to God's people. After 11 years, his time was over. He moved to a smaller church. But now, if I can tell you, because I still follow him online, how that church has grown. Because when he got there, those people needed him more. And he was able to put his ministry to practice. And the church grew. And the church is still growing. I don't know now with covid but, some, but Jesus was the same. When he's done God's work at one place, what did he do? He go, goes to another place. Why? Because the good news are meant for everyone. Because the gospel is meant for us all. The gospel is not for the selected few. The gospel is for everyone because Jesus came here to spread the good news, to preach the gospel to everyone. So that is what he's reminding us here in the disciples. So therefore, friends, this morning we are reminded that Jesus does visit the, the sick. Jesus does not turn anyone away. Jesus lived and led a prayerful life. And Jesus reminds us that the good news is for everyone. So therefore, friends, after hearing all of this, now what is left for you to do is to continue to spread the good news. What is left for you to do then now is to make Jesus known throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Father, I give you thanks and praise, Lord Jesus, for this morning. Thanks and praise for your word. Thanks and praise for the choir for leading us, God, to the moment where we heard your word. And now, Father, I pray that we may then go out there and share this good news with other people. Bless us. Lord, we're living in difficult times. I know. But I hope and pray that we'll always trust in you. So thank you, Father, for this story. Thank you for the work that Jesus has done and continue to do. Bless this church. Bless your people. I pray all these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.